Hello, this is another story from um, the book of Magical Animals by Ruth Manning Sanders, the second story in fact, and it's a Russian tale entitled The Little Humpbacked Horse, part one, The Firebird. A farmer had three sons, Daniel was the eldest, Gabriel came next and Jack was the youngest. The farmer sowed many acres of wheat. The wheat sprang up strong and vigorous. But just as the ears began to turn golden, there came a thief in the night who tore up the wheat in one place and trampled it down in another, but left no footmarks to tell what manner of thief it might be, whether man or beast. So. The farmer said that his sons should take it in turns to guard the fields at night. And that evening he gave Daniel a pitchfork and an axe and a coil of rope and sent him to the fields. But the night was dark and stormy and it began to rain. No, Daniel wasn't going to catch his death of cold for any tiresome thief. So he went up into the hayloft over the stables and there, on a soft bed of hay, he slept peacefully until dawn. Then he jumped up and ran to the water trough in the yard, filled a bucket, soused his head and shoulders, and so, dripping wet, went to bang on the farmhouse door. Hey, 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 open up! Gabriel came. Well, brother, did you see anything? Did you hear anything? Did you catch the thief? And Daniel answered, I saw nothing but darkness. I heard nothing but the wind. I caught nothing unless it be my death of cold. Surely it can be only the wind and the rain that tear up and trample down and leave no footmarks of their coming and going. I do not think it is the wind and the rain, said the farmer. And the next night he sent Gabriel to keep watch. But Gabriel didn't even trouble going to the fields. He strolled off to the village, spent the night merrily enough with one or two of his friends, and returning before Cockrow, came to knock on the farmhouse door. Ay, 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 open up! This time the farmer himself opened the door. Well, my son, what have you seen? What have you heard? Grey shapes gliding and hollow voices moaning. They are ghosts that haunt our fields, and against ghosts what can man do? I do not think it can be ghosts said the farmer, and that night he sent Jack to watch. So off goes Jack with his pitchfork and his axe and his coil of rope. He sits down behind a holly bush, and he keeps himself awake by counting the stars. <coughs> and yet he was nearly asleep when there came a soft rustling and a stealthy stepping and a fragrant breathing some creature passing by on cautious feet. Jack jumped up. What did he see? A great white mare with mane and tail of brilliant gold that glittered in the starlight. Now she was in the wheat trampling down the blades, nibbling off the ears, tossing her gleaming head, moving on and leaving a trail of ruin behind her. Jack stood up. Cautiously, on tiptoe, holding his breath, moving without a sound, he crept after the mare. A leap! He had her by the glittering mane. Another leap as she swung round and he was up on her back, but, alas, with his face to her tail. And clinging to that for dear life, for she was offered a furious gallop over the fields, and on and on, uphill, down dale, kicking up her heels, rearing, bucking, now on her hind legs, now on her forelegs, and Jack scarcely conscious of where he was or what was happening, but still stubbornly clinging on, until, in her wild gallop, she came back into the fields and stopped beside the holly bush, with such a sudden jerk that Jack slid from her back, and thinking he had lost her, made a grab at her mane. But she stood quietly, breathing through wide open nostrils, and said, Jack, I own I am beaten, so now we must part friends. Let me go, and I will give you two horses like myself, 
So beautiful, so beautiful that their equal has never yet been seen by mortal man. And I will give you also a third horse, a very little one. The first two you may sell, but never, never part with the little one, for you will find him the best friend that ever man had. Jack thought, and he said, All right. And the mare galloped away. Jack thought again, Well, there, maybe I've been a fool to let her go. No, he hadn't been a fool. For see now, trotting towards him, come two most beautiful horses, white like the mare and like her, with manes and tails of purest gold, tossing their lovely heads and prancing in their pride. They trot up to stand one on each side of Jack as if to say, at your order, master. But I've seen what's coming now. A tiny, tiny horse, no bigger than a fox, and like no creature you have ever seen, nor I, right? for he has ears a yard long and two humps on his back. Oh, ho! Jack takes up his coil of rope, chops off three tidy lengths with his axe, Ties up the three horses to the holly bush and scampers home with a bang on the farmhouse door. The farmer comes to the door. Well, son, did you see, hear anything? Did you see anything? Hey, little father, I caught three horses. Well done, my son. And where are they? Hey, little father, I tied them to a bush. You come and see. But the farmer said, you are cold and you must be hungry. First you shall have breakfast and then you shall take me to see the horses. So Jack went into the kitchen to have his breakfast. Then Daniel winked at Gabriel and Gabriel nodded at Daniel. They stole out, they fetched two bridles, they ran to the fields, they came to the bush, they untied the two beautiful white horses with golden manes, they bridled them, jumped on their backs, and off at a gallop to sell the horses in the city. So, when Jack, having breakfasted all joyful, brings his father to the bush in the field, what does he see there? Only the tiny horse with his two humps and his yard long ears. Oh, 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 someone has stolen my lovely horses, someone has stolen them. Jack shed tears, he fairly howled, he cursed the thieves. Someone has stolen my lovely horses, my lovely white horses with the golden manes and tails. The farmer didn't know what to make of it. He left Jack blubbering and cursing and went home. But then little Humpy came up and spoke. Jack, Jack, this won't do. You are cursing your own brothers, for it is they who have stolen from the golden mane horses. But quick, Jack, on to my back with you, and we'll soon catch up with the golden manes. When I gallop, I go swifter than any wind that blows. So Jack sat on Humpy's back between the two humps, and off galloped the little horse, with his long ears streaming out on either side, and Jack glad enough to get hold of those long ears, for sometimes Humpy was rushing over the ground, and sometimes he was rushing through the air, and the world was whizzing backwards past Jack at such a rate that he had to shut his eyes for very giddiness. There they are, cried Humpy, and Jack, opening his eyes, saw flashes of gold on the road ahead, Daniel and Gabriel galloping fast on the golden maned horses. Yes, they were galloping fast, but Humpy was galloping faster. He caught up with Daniel and Gabriel. He took a spring right over their heads and came down on the road in front of them. Daniel and Gabriel had to pull up then. They were looking very foolish. And who would ever have believed, cried Jack, that brothers would steal a brother's horses? Oh, no, brother, not steal, said Daniel. We were only taking them to the city to sell for little father, to make up for the loss of the wheat. Don't you agree that little father should be paid for the loss of the wheat? Well, Jack was easy going, and Daniel was sly. 
He talked to Jack round, and soon they were all three riding to the city together. So on they rode, and on they rode, and the sun set. And it was twilight, and then night. There was no moon. The sky was clouded, not a star was showing, and it was very dark, except for the brightness of the golden manes and tails, and that brightness only made the surrounding night more black. Daniel said, let us all tear under these trees by the side of the road, tether the horses, and wait the dawn. Well, they did that, but it was very cold under the trees. Gabriel grumbled, Daniel said, See there, see there, across the field, surely a fire burning. If we had a burning brand, we could make a fire. Jack, be good to us. Hurry on your swift little horse and beg a lighted brand from whoever it is that has one. So, good-natured Jack, loose humpy, and got on his back, one leap, and he was across off the fields. And what did Daniel and Gabriel do then? They untethered the golden mane horses and mounted and galloped away on the road to the city. Meanwhile, Humpy was carrying Jack across the fields, and the nearer they drew to the fiery light, the bigger and brighter it became, until it seemed to light up the world. Every leaf on every tree sparkled, and the grass under Humpy's feet shone in the world. That must be the biggest fire ever man made, said Jack. But there seems to be no smoke, and I feel no heat. Me pause, it isn't a fire, said Humpy. It's a feather from a firebird's wing. And now that you know what it is, we'd best be turning back. Oh no, said Jack, oh no, I must have that feather. Humpy said, leave the feather where it is. Jack said, no, I must have it. And he urged Humpy on to where the feather lay glittering on the grass, picked it up, wrapped it in his handkerchief, put it in his pocket. Now everything was dark. No good will come of this, said Humpy, and trotted back to the high road. Well, there, Daniel and Gabriel had gone, the golden mane horses had gone, there was nothing to do but chase after them again. And chase after them Jack and Humpy did, and caught up with them next morning, just as they were entering the city, and all rode in together. Jack, this time, very haughty and his brothers feeling very foolish, and making excuses which Jack wouldn't listen to. But they had scarcely entered the city before they were surrounded by a crowd of people, and the crowd grew bigger and bigger as they made their way to the marketplace, for such horses as these golden rain horses had never before been seen in that town or in any other town, and as to little Humpy he was a-showing himself. When the news came to the Tsar, and the Tsar ordered out his carriage and drove to the marketplace, and as soon as he sees those two horses, yes, he must buy them. And who is the owner? Well, Jack is the owner. And will Jack sell them? Well, yes, Jack thinks he will. And what does Jack want for them? Well, Jack thinks his hat full of gold would do, obviously. So he gets his hat full of gold, and the Tsar orders four of his grooms to lead away the horses. But the horses won't be led away. They break the reins, kick up their heels, and trot back to Jack. Well then, Jack must lead them to the royal stables, and so he does, and Humpy follows. And Jack, having seen the horses into their stalls, goes off with Humpy to an inn. But first he finds a trusty messenger and sends the gold home to his father, with a scrawled note which says, The little father from the golden maned horses to pay for the trampled wheat. Then, of course, Jack's brothers, Daniel and Gabriel, come to the inn, all smirks and flatterings, hoping for a share of the gold. But Jack shows them his empty hat and tells them that the gold's gone to little father. So then they sneak off out of the city and out of the story too, and good riddance. But up in the Tsar's stables, 
The golden main horses are moping. They won't eat, they won't drink, they won't be groomed, they kick and bite when the grooms come near. They grow shaggy and grubby mere bags of bones. It looks as if they are starving themselves to death. What's to be done? The Tsar sends for Jack. He's angry, he upbraids Jack for selling him bewitched horses. Bewitched? Nonsense. Jack goes to the stable. See here, the golden mane horses winning in their welcome. Now they will eat, now they will drink. Now they will stand quiet for Jack to groom them. Well then, that's how it is. If the Tsar would keep the golden mane horses, he must also keep Jack. And if he keeps Jack, he must also keep Humpy. So now he's Jack. Happy with his golden mane charges and his little friend Humpy, leading a merry life and liked by everybody for his good-tempered ways. And the Tsar was a bit of a tartar. Well, that didn't seem to matter for a while. But, oh dear me, there came a day when it did matter. And it all happened through the firebird's feather which, in spite of Humpy's warning, Jack had picked up and now always kept in his pocket. Well, one morning when Jack was having a friendly wrestling match with another groom, the feather dropped out of his pocket and lay in the sunshine of the courtyard unnoticed by either of them. But that same evening the young groom happened to go to the courtyard, and what did he see? The whole place lit up and bright as noonday. And in the middle of the courtyard, a golden feather, blazing away more brilliantly than the brightest lamp. Oh, oh, oh. The young groom picked up the feather and ran with it to the Tsar. The Tsar said, Where did you find this? The groom said, In the courtyard, I think it must have fallen out of Jack's pocket. The Tsar sent for Jack. Jack, does this feather belong to you? Yes, it does. And where did you get it? I found it in the field. Well then, be off to the field and bring me the bird who dropped the feather. Oh, your high mightiness, I can't do that. Hunt! You say hunt to me? Heads have rolled for speaking that word when your Tsar gives an order. Go, do as I bid. Jack went off to tell Humpy. He was near to crying. Oh, Humpy dear, the Tsar has ordered me to bring him the firebird, and oh, Humpy dear, it seems that it's off with my head if I don't bring it. Well, there you are, Jack. What did I tell you? You should never have picked out that feather. But come now, ask the Tsar for two troughs, a big jar full of honey, a pair of thick gloves, and a strong sack. Also, food for our journey. Then we'll be off. Where to, Humpy dear? Stupid! To catch a firebird! So, Jack went to the Tsar and got the two troughs and the jar of honey and the pair of thick gloves and the strong sack and plenty of food for the journey. He brought all those things to Humpy and whether Humpy had made those things small or whether on the other hand he had made himself big I can't tell you because nobody has ever told me but somehow or other Humpy took everything on his back and Jack along with them and in less than no time he was whizzing away sometimes through the air and sometimes along the ground for seven days and seven nights. On the eighth day they came to a great forest and in the forest was a wide glade and beyond the glade rose a silver hill. At the foot of the hill flowed a sparkling stream. The grass in the glade shone brighter than any emerald. It fairly glittered and as to the flowers that grew among the grass, they were of a beauty and a colour and a fragrance beyond all telling. Journey's end, said Humpy, shaking everything Jack included off his back. For oh, this is where the firebird comes at midnight to drink and bathe in the stream. Now, Jack, pour the honey into one trough. Turn the other trough upside down, 
and hide yourself under it. The birds will come to the honey trough, then you will creep out from under your trough, and with your gloved hands grab the bird nearest to you. It will peck and claw and scream, of course, but you mustn't mind that. Just give a shout and it will come to help you. And so, goodbye until midnight. Then Humpy galloped away up the Silver Mountain, and there was Jack all alone in the flowery glade. Well, he set the troughs side by side on the bank of the stream, poured honey into one trough, turned the other trough upside down, crawled under it, put on the thick gloves, and waited. The sun went down behind the silver hill. The flowers folded their petals. It was twilight. It was night. Clouds hid the stars. Jack crouched under his trough, felt cold and stiff. He peeped out, oh, how dark it was, and how completely still. No, listen. Beyond the silver hill, the screeching, and a flurry of wings, and look, behind the silver hill, a great light that fanned out on every side, that grew and grew, that rose, that topped the hill, that poured down the hither side of the hill, the lights of hundreds of flaming wings, as the firebirds shrilly screaming flew down into the valley, and running in the confusion of blazing lights and bobbing shadows, gathered round the honey trough, plunging their long beaks into the honey, and fighting and squalling without a thought of but getting the biggest share of the unexpected feast. Slowly, cautiously, as if a monster snail were crawling there, Jack under his trough moves nearer and nearer to the greedy, gulping, quarrelling birds. Now he is quite close to them. Out darts his gloved hand. He grabs the long, fiery tail of the bird nearest to him. The bird screams, tries to fly up. All the birds scream. All the birds except one fly up. All the birds go over Jack's trough. Over goes the honey trough in a whirl of glittering feathers and piercing screams. The flock of firebirds wheels round and up and away all but the one bird which Jack still clutches by the tail, and though it pecks most viciously at, its, at his hand, its beak cannot pierce through the thick gloves. And Humpy, Humpy, shouts Jack in his wild excitement, I have him, I've caught him, Humpy, Humpy, Humpy. And here's little Humpy, galloping, sack in mouth, into the sack then with the struggling, protesting firebird, the neck of the sack firmly tied, and Jack and sack and firebird all up on Humpy's back, and Humpy galloping away through the forest, and galloping, galloping over the ground, or is it through the air, Jack scarcely knows which, or where he is, they are going so swiftly in here, in the dawn of the day, or the next, or the next after that, who can tell? But here they are at last, back in the courtyard of the Tsar's palace. And Jack is running into the palace and shouting, Tsar, Tsar, I've got him, I've got the firebird. And dumping the sack down on the table, and the Tsar hurrying in his nightgown, followed by a crowd of startled courtiers, who at Jack's command close all the shutters, leaving the room in the darkness. Then, laughing, and panting, Jack unties the sack, and on the instant there is such a fierce blaze of flaming lights as sets everyone shouting, Fire, fire, water, water! <coughs> but their fright turns to exclamations of wonder and delight as the firebird, somewhat bedraggled, struggles out of the sack and stands there on the table, defiantly preening its brilliant feathers. Part 2. 
the moon was a daughter. The Tsar had a golden collar and a gold chain made for the firebird. It lit up the whole palace at night, and for a while the Tsar was delighted with it. But it was forever pecking at him and scratching him and screaming, and so by and by the Tsar got tired of it and set it free to fly away to its silver mountain. So then... He must have something else to amuse him. But what? What else? Why a new wife, to be sure? And though the Tsar was old and fat and ugly, it went without saying that his new wife must be young and beautiful. So, who should she be? Who but the moon's daughter? Elena the Lovely. And who should go and fetch that maiden for him? Who but Jack? So the Tsar sent for Jack and said, Jack, I have a mind to marry again. Go fetch me the moon's daughter. Jack said, Oh, oh no, I, 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 I don't think I can do that. The Tsar said, Oh, yes, do it, you must, or I will have your head. Jack sad and sorrowful, went to Humpy in his stable. Humpy said, what's the matter this time? Jack told him, and Humpy said, all this comes of picking up that feather I told you not to. Jack said, oh, dear Humpy, help me now, or I'll have my head. Humpy said, I don't know that you deserve help, but I will help you. Now, listen to me. Princess Selina, the lovely daughter of the moon, lives sometimes in the sea, and sometimes in the sky. And sometimes, when the days are still and the sea is calm, she rows over the sea in a golden boat with silver oars. Then she will bring her boat into the shallows and step on shore to rest and refresh herself <coughs> and play sweet music on her dulcimer. It is then that we may catch her. Go, ask the Tsar for a gold-embroidered tent, a dainty little table, an ivory chair curiously wrought, a padded footstool, some sweet meats and rare wine. Also, a few silver dishes and a goblet or two or precious glass and hurry for it is time we set off so jack got all these things from the czar and humpy took them on his back and jack as well and off they went galloping galloping and after a long time or a short time came to the shore of the great ocean. And the day was bright and the sea calm, and there on the shore, where the short grass met the white sand, Jack, on Humpy's orders, pitched the gold-embroidered tent, and set within it the ivory chair curiously wrought, and the padded footstool and the dainty little table spread, with the silver dishes filled with sweetmeats, and the goblets of precious grass and the rare wine. And when all this was done, Humpy said, Look over the ocean. Do you see a glittering of gold and a twinkling of silver? Look over the ocean. Do you see a glittering of gold and a twinkling of silver? Yes, I see. Humpy said, That is the princess's little boat making this way. So now, Jack, Behind the tent with you, crouch down, 
Let the princess come in to the tent. Let her refresh herself with the wine and the sweet meats. Let her play her dulcimer and sing her songs. And when she is wrapped away by the sound of her own sweet singing, run into the tent, take her in your arms and call for me. Be heedful, be swift. If you lose this chance, you may not get another. Then he galloped away, and Jack went to crouch behind under the gold embroidered tent. Now, on the blue sea, the glitter of the golden boat and the twinkling of the silver oars drew nearer and nearer. Now, the beautiful princess Elena brought her boat to land. And lifting up her flowing robes with one hand and taking her dulcimer with the other, stepped ashore. Wondering, she sees the gold and bright tent, steps up to it, peeps inside. Oh, she thinks to herself, my dear Mother Moon must have put this here to surprise and delight me. And in she goes, and down she sits, tastes the sweetmeat, sips the wine, and, refreshed and happy, takes up her dulcimer and plays and sings. Ah, how deftly she plays, how sweetly she sings. The thoughts are carried far away on the wings of her own sweet singing. Now, Jack, this is your chance. But did you ever? Jack, too, has been carried away by that sweet singing, lulled into a vague and dreamy happiness. He has actually fallen asleep, and sleep he does till sunset. And then it is Humpy's indignant prodding hoof that wakes him. Fool! The sun has gone down, the evening star is shining, the princess has gathered up her flowing robes and stepped back into her golden boat. The boat is now but a speck on the horizon. Well, after all, you can go your own way, but it is not I who will lose my head. Poor Jack bursts out of love him. Oh, me, will Humpy forgive him, for surely he will never forgive himself, and now what's to be done? Wait till tomorrow, says Humpy, when maybe the princess will come once more. But if you fall asleep again, I'll leave you lying there and go home without you. Then Humpy kicked up his heels and galloped off. Jack spent a miserable night. But in the morning, as he paced the shore and looked out over to the quiet ocean, what does he see? A glittering of gold and a twinkling of silver. Yes, it is the Princess Elena's little boat coming this way. Jack runs behind the tent. He snatches up staff shirts, sharp stones, and bits of board from old wrecks. The boards have nails sticking up in them, so much the better. Jack piles up stones and boards into an uneasy, lumpy, nail-bristling couch and sprawls face downwards on it. Now, he thinks, fall asleep if you can. Elena, that lucky princess, brings her boat to land. She gathers up her flowing robe, she steps ashore, she trips lightly to the tent, she takes a seat, eats drinks, picks up her dulcimer, and softly, sweetly begins to play and sing. Ah, how drowsy and gentle that playing, that sweet low singing, makes our Jack. His eyes close, his head nods, is he going to fall asleep again? Not he. The jacket stones and the rusty nails prod his drowsy, drowsy body with sharp reminders. Keep awake, keep awake. He leaps to his feet, he rushes into the tent, he flings his arms around the beautiful Elena, he bawls at the top of his voice, Humpy, Humpy! And here comes Humpy galloping. Jack is up on Humpy's back, the lovely Elena clasped in his arms. Humpy is up in the air and away. As for the gold embroidered tent and all that it contains, well, it can wait for the storm's water to carry it out to sea, and the fishes can feast on what's left of the sweetmeats. Now, 
In the royal palace, the beautiful Princess Elena, the moon's daughter, sits at table with the Tsar. She is sucking and no wonder. That stupid old Tsar has been making what one would-be pretty speech after another, but she doesn't seem to be listening. The Tsar speaks of their marriage, of the guests who are already invited, of the feast that is already being prepared. And Princess Elena, the moon's daughter, opens her proud lips. My jewels, my head ornaments, my robes of state, my golden slippers, all things fitting for my bridal, are in a chest at the bottom of the sea. Let them be fetched. Now then. The Tsar says, if it will please her. Of course they shall be fetched, and Jack must fetch them. Oh, this is too much, Jack almost says no. And it isn't the Tsar shouting and bawling at him that makes him change his mind and agree to do it. It is something in the look of the princess as she turns her beautiful eyes upon him. Go for my sake, Jack, that look seems to be saying. Do just this one thing for me, dear Jack, that misery may be turned into joy. So Jack bows to the Tsar. Yes, Jack is learning courtly manners, and says, I will set out at once. And then the lovely Elena speaks again. On your way, perhaps you will kindly pay a visit to my mother, the moon and ask her why for three long nights she hasn't let her face be seen, but keeps it hidden behind dusky clouds. I will ask her, my princess, says Jack, and bows once more, and goes out to little Humby in the stables. So we must be off again, Jack, says Humby. Seems we must, says Jack. I think this will be the last time, says Humpy. Well, I hope so with all my heart, says Jack. Then up you get Jack and we'll be off. So, off they went, galloping, galloping, whether for a short time or a long time, who knows, and came at last to the verge of a great stretch of sea with more land on the farther side of it. And there they saw a wonder, for across the sea, making a bridge from one land to the other, lay a monstrous whale. On his tail there grew a forest, on his back was built a town. On his brow youths and maidens were dancing, and in the darkness of his mouth children were gathering mushrooms. So over the whale bridge Jack and Humpy trotted from one land to the other. They reached the farther shore, and then the way last in a hoarse and melancholy voice, with a bound. And Humpy answered, to the farthest east, to the silver palace of the Lady Moon. And the whale spoke again in his hoarse and melancholy voice. Ask her then from me how long I must lie here helpless to be trampled on by these unfeeling feet. Ask her what sin I have committed, and how I may atone. And Humpy answered, Yes, we will ask her. And gave a leap. And now he was speeding up towards the sky, higher and higher, with Jack clinging to his long ears, and bursting into song for the delight of buffeting into and through the woolly white clouds and galloping over the blue meadows that stretched above the clouds on every side of them. Now see in the distance a silver gleaming and every moment coming nearer and nearer the high shining towers of the palace of the Lady Moon and now they have reached the palace and there on her palace balcony 
sits Lady Moon, telling fortunes with her pack of cards. Her good, round-tempered face, all dimpled with amiable smiles. So, Humpy comes to a stop under the balcony, and Jack alights, hat in hand and making his best bow. Welcome, Jack, the farmer's son, for so I take you to be, says Lady Moon. Come up to stand by me and tell me what brings you here. And so Jack goes up into the balcony and tells the Lady Moon that he comes with a message from her daughter, the Princess Elena. The Princess would know why for three days and three nights Lady Moon hasn't let her face be seen, but keeps it hidden behind dusky clouds. Ah, Jack, my dear, says Lady Moon, I have been so troubled over the fate of my dearest Elena, and that is why I have hidden my face, for I could not well bear to think that my beautiful daughter should be married in her seventeenth year to that old selfish, ugly tempered Tsar, who is seventy if he is a day. But now the cards tell me otherwise, and so I can smile again. Carry back to my daughter her mother's love, Jack. And if you give her your own love at the same time, so much the better. Then Jack asked about the whale, and the Lady Moon said, the whale is punished because he has swallowed and keeps prisoner in his belly a fleet of thirty ships belonging to Lord Sun. Let him give up those ships and he shall be barred on. But now away with you, Jack, for your tasks are still unfinished. Tell my dearest daughter not to grieve. Tell her she shall not marry any old baboon or a czar. Tell her that her mother promises her a young and handsome husband. But I'm not telling you, Jack, who that young and handsome husband shall be. And with that, Lady Moon's round face was all lit up with smiles, and she kissed Jack on both cheeks and bade him be off. So, Humpy and Jack sped across the blue sky, meadows and down through the woolly white clouds, and so to earth and came to where the great whale bridged the sea between the two lands. The whale was looking very miserable, but he cheered up when he saw Jack and Humpy. And when he heard about the ships, he gave a tremendous laugh and a tremendous hick, and out of his great mouth came gliding thirty golden ships the fleet belonging to the Lord's son. And the ships hoisted their golden sails and moved away across the water with the sailors tossing their caps up and shouting, Hurrah! Ha ha ha! laughed the whale and was going to plunge down into the sea. But Humpy cried out, Stop! Stop! Do you want to drown a town full of people? And a company of dancing 
maids and maidens, and all those little mushroom gatherers. Is that your gratitude? Oh dear, said the whale, I had forgotten all about them. Then Humpy galloped from end to end of the whale's great body and ordered all the people in the town and all the dancing youths and maidens and all the children who were picking mushrooms to get back on land. And they went, a great procession of them. And Humpy said to the whale, Now, old fellow, you're free, and you can just show your gratitude to Jack and me by going down to the bottom of the ocean and bringing up a casket belonging to the moon's daughter, Elena the Beautiful. So the whale plunged her down, and in less than no time came up again with a golden casket in his mouth. And Humpy said, Take the casket, Jack, and we'll be off. But Jack cried out, No, I won't take it. I don't want to take it. Well, and why not? said Humpy. Because, said Jack, and he was almost crying, because the wedding guests are already invited, and the wedding feast is already prepared. And in her jewels, her head ornaments, her robes of state, and the golden slippers, the Princess Elena is to marry the fat old Tsar, and, oh, my heart is breaking. Humpy laughed. <laughs> Lady Moon promised something different, he said. The Lady Moon promised her daughter, young and handsome husband. I don't care how handsome or how young he is, mumbled Jack. I hate him, whoever he is, I hate him. But he took the casket, and they said goodbye to the happy whale. And Humpy galloped off, sometimes whizzing through the air and sometimes whizzing over the earth, till they were back in the Tsar's city. Every bell in the city was ringing. And in the streets, fountains of wine gushed and be red round the fountains that people were dancing. In the palace, the feast was spread. In the church, the priest was waiting. The palace gates were open wide. The princess Elena had received her casket. And see now, out of the palace gates, issues the grand procession. The ugly old Tsar riding in the golden carriage, the lovely princess wearing her glittering jewels, her head ornaments, her robes of state, her golden slippers, is seated beside him. And behind them came coachload of, after coachload of lords and ladies and neighbouring princes and court officials with soldiers in rank upon rank, marching before and behind and on every side. Humpy is dancing with excitement, but Jack turns away his head. No, he won't look. There are tears in his eyes. The grand procession reaches the church door. The Tsar is handling the princess out of the carriage. It seems that her fate is sealed. But see there, see there, floating down from the clear sky and coming nearer and nearer is a great silver light. And in the silver light, a winged chariot, and seated in the winged chariot, the Lady Moon. The Lady Moon leans from the chariot. She stretches out her arms and snatches up the ugly old Tsar and carries him away, 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 right up to her palace in the sky. And there she gives him a shake and sets him down and puts him to mind her flock of geese forevermore. Must the priest then close his book and go home? Must the wedding guests depart and the wedding feast remain untasted? Not a bit. Of it. The princess has chosen for herself. She knows whom she loves. She knows whom she will marry. She goes to where Jack stands weeping. She puts her hand in his. She leads him to the church. She says to the priest, Here is my beloved. Here is the one who is to be my husband. Come now, do your duty, Marius, Marius. And Jack, with all his tears, turns to smiles, answers, Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, Marius, Marius. 
Then all the people cheered, and the wedding guests laughed and clapped their hands, and the bells rang out merrily, merrily, and Jack and Elena the beautiful were married, and the wedding feast was not wasted, and everyone made merry. And Jack and his lovely princess and little Humpy lived happily, none more happily ever 